Hey, good morning, or at least evening for me. Thank you, Brian. So my talk will be about using GraphQL as a data layer for a user interface. So as we are at the Jamstack conference, you probably know what the A stands for, which is API. And GraphQL APIs are one of my favorite APIs. So who's this talk actually for? Um, of course, for all of you, we want to work with the Jamstack or actually are working with the Jamstack already. It's also for those people in here who are curious about GraphQL, who might want to use GraphQL, maybe already use GraphQL. Sorry. Ah, I was. Let's search. Screen sharing now. Hmm. Sorry, folks. So somehow the screen share breaks. So you saw, you heard this slide, you heard this slide, and then we're here. So this talk will mainly focus about how you can get a GraphQL API if you don't have one already. So maybe you already have a REST API. Maybe you already have a database. Maybe you're just getting your data from, uh, from Markdown, which I know I did for some websites. Um, but sometimes you're in a situation that you really want this GraphQL API, but maybe you have a backend team that says, no, we're not gonna build a GraphQL API for you. And I've seen this happen a lot with different companies, front end people being really excited about using GraphQL and then backend people being um, not neglected, but maybe not so positive as front end people are about GraphQL APIs. So in this talk, I'll show you how you can get a GraphQL API without having to actually convince your backend team that you should build one for you. So a little bit about myself. So as Brian said, I'm Roy, I'm from Amsterdam. You can find me on Twitter with the handle GetHackTeam. And um, I'll work with a company called Stepsen. And with Stepsen, we want to make GraphQL easier for people and also give you a GraphQL API without having to worry about any deployments at all. And next to this, I'm also writing books. And my most, um, most recent one is called Full Stack GraphQL, which I, uh, I co-authored with someone else. And if you're curious about GraphQL after this talk, make sure to read it in order to know how you can build Full Stack GraphQL applications. So before diving into how to create a GraphQL API, let's have a short look about what GraphQL actually is. And I know probably a lot of you have GraphQL experience and maybe for you, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice fresher up seeing what GraphQL is again. So GraphQL is a query language for APIs and it's not important enough to keep stating it's a query language um, after all, because people often think GraphQL is a framework on its own or GraphQL is a, is a technology they can use with JavaScript. Um, it is technology you can use with JavaScript, but it's platform agnostic. So GraphQL itself is a query language for APIs. It's not directly tied to any language. So if you think GraphQL is just for JavaScript people, uh, then you're wrong because you can use it for any other programming language you want. But often it's quite often used by JavaScript people and probably most of you are today. So let's, um, let's just keep assuming it's perfect for GraphQL and JavaScript people. So as a query language, it has, um, it has certain specifics and the most important specific being that you can get exactly what you want in a way you request it. So if you send a request like you see on the left, on the left, you can see a query and this query will get us some data from GitHub. And GitHub is actually one of the biggest companies with a public GraphQL API. So if you want to learn more about GraphQL and how you can use with actual data you might already have, have a look at the GitHub, GitHub GraphQL API. So on the left, you can see my query. And my query is my, um, it's the information I send to my, uh, to my API in order it will return my data. So if you look at the left side, you can see um, all these fields defined. So you can see I have a query called GitHub queries. I have a query called GitHub underscore user. I'm gonna give it some parameters, which is a GitHub username. And then I will request some fields. And you can see some fields are nested, which means these are also nested data. So the data response on the right side, you can see it has the exact same shape as the query we have on the left side. So as you can see there, we're requesting uh, a bio, which you can see is being returned. You can see we're requesting follower information, which is indeed a nested relationship because followers is a object and the edges and nodes are actually an array. So asking the data in a specific format and getting that specific format back in your response is one of the main 
uh, things people like about GraphQL. And it often lets me think about, um, well, the song from the Spice Girls. So if, you're, uh, if you have been around when they were popular, then uh, you might recall the song. And GraphQL is also about it. So you tell GraphQL what you want, what you really want, and you will get the data in that exact shape. And the next specific of GraphQL is that it offers a single endpoint for multiple resources. So we already saw we had a nested relationship in a previous query. If we look at a different query, uh, this time it's Twitter, it's not GitHub. And you'll see why I'm using Twitter and GitHub later on, as I have a short demo, which will be using both these uh, APIs. As you can see here, we have this nested relationships. And I told you about the nested relationship in the previous query. Uh, but here you can see it again. So you can see we are requesting author information about a specific tweet, and then it will return the nested information. And this can be coming from multiple resources as well. So I'm not familiar how are you how familiar you are with Twitter architecture. I'm not that familiar as well, but you can assume a company this size has microservices. And the nice thing about GraphQL is that you can use uh, one query to get data from multiple resources. And these resources can be multiple services. So in case you have microservices, it could be that this data comes from these different microservices. And these nested relationships are perfect for this. And then the final thing that's important to know about GraphQL is based on the type system. So you might be using TypeScript instead of JavaScript in your Gemstack project. Um, GraphQL is a similar type system, except it's not TypeScript, it's GraphQL query language or actual GraphQL schema design language. And it's all built on a, based on a type system. So if you look at this query we just sent to Twitter, you can see every field has a type definition. So we have a field called created underscore it, which has the shape of a date. And then we have a field called location, which has the field of a string. So you can see here the type system is, um, is comparable to what you might know from TypeScript. You can see we both have strings, we have dates, and dates would be a uh, a custom type in TypeScript. It's also a custom type in, uh, in GraphQL. So you can see this type system is also a very powerful specific of GraphQL. And then uh, I often hear people saying GraphQL is seen as a replacement for REST. And I can understand where people come from because typically you used to have a REST API and then at some point you move to GraphQL as your main source of API. So that's how people see it as a replacement. But I rather see the two coexisting um, because by using them coexisted, you can actually do a lot of extra work or actually save yourself a lot of extra work by transforming REST into GraphQL automatically. And I'm saying automatically here because uh, you don't need that much information to do so. It only needs to run a couple of CLI commands and you're actually being able to use your REST APIs as GraphQL endpoints. Or actually one GraphQL endpoint because if you keep notice in the first part of this um, this presentation, GraphQL has one single endpoint in which you can query all your different resources. So looking back, you might think about this in, um, in the same way. So in a REST approach, if you have different REST endpoints, you can actually transform them into one GraphQL endpoint or specifically one GraphQL API, which serves all your REST endpoints to the magic of queries. And how is that done? It's actually being done by using GraphQL schema as a single source of truth. So in a GraphQL schema, you can define whatever REST endpoints you want to call and what uh, information they should return to your GraphQL API. And we're all doing this through a service called StepSend. And with StepSend, you can do many things. But one of the most important things you can do is have your GraphQL API running in seconds and they also have it deployed for you. So you no longer have to worry about deploying a GraphQL API or about bringing a server up in the air that hosts your GraphQL endpoints or actually a single endpoint then instead you can, can rely on a service, which is now called StepSend, in order to do all this for you. So what does it look like? So typically it looks a bit like this. So on the right side, you can see StepSend. You can see StepSend has multiple ways to connect backends into one API. And then on the left side, you can see you or your client uh, sending requests over the internet. So over HTTP or HTTPS. And every client can send GraphQL queries to StepSend over this HTTP client unless you don't submit any credentials, of course, because we try to keep your GraphQL API as safe as possible. So you can connect any backend or data source using custom directives. And custom directives are uh, a way to extend GraphQL schemas or GraphQL APIs without having to actually change the core GraphQL specifics. So 
directives are part of the graphical specification. So by using custom directives to extend your graphical schema, uh, you're staying well beyond all the limits without having to write any code to connect any of these backend sources. So roughly you can connect any database using a DB query custom directive, any REST API using at rest, or even other GraphQL APIs by using the at GraphQL directive. And then assuming you provide um, the GraphQL API built by StepSend with the correct credentials, you can query this from uh, any client. And the nice thing is you can get a fully performance serverless GraphQL API. So we even uh, can start doing serverless APIs now without having to worry about the connectivity of this API because we all do all this for you. So as a front end or Jamstack developer, you no longer have to worry about where to host your API or how to make it run. So let's try this out. And to make this as simple as possible for you, I actually um, brought today a demo of a GraphQL Studio. So GraphQL Studio is um, one of the products that I had. And with GraphQL Studio, you can introspect GraphQL APIs from your web browser. So if you would go to graphql.stepsend.com or by scanning this, uh, this fancy QR code, you can find um, a GraphQL Studio, which is a in-browser IDE in which you can explore different APIs. And these are uh, REST APIs from uh, other services you might know like GitHub or Twitter, which we just saw, or even um, have the CMS systems like um, I can show you in the demo, there are multiple ones or combinations of all these different systems. So that's one of the nice things as well. We also have community run APIs, which are brought together by communities, which I will show you on this page. So if you would go to graphql.stepsend.com, you would actually find this GraphQL Studio, which lets me make my screen a bit bigger. You can see we have all these pre-built APIs, which are um, well, either services like, uh, like GitHub, which we already saw, or GitLab even, uh, or even CMS products like Agility or Contentful. So all these APIs are something you can find in graphql.stepsend.com. And it's good to know that these are pre-built for you. So you don't even have to write a schema in order to connect with them. The only thing you need to do is using them either in a studio or download them as I'll show you later on. And actually the nice part is these combinations. So these are combinations of APIs brought together in one schema. And as you can see, we even have community ones, which is one to combine Spotify with the Google API. And we also have the one which I'll be showing you today, which is something I like to call a developer publishing pack. So this is perfect if you want to make a portfolio website. So suppose you're posting articles on DevTo, um, you're active on GitHub, maybe on uh, projects you're working on, and then you even like to send around some tweets like I do. So if you want to use the starter pack, the only thing you have to do is press here, and it will be uh, creating this schema for you. And then you can, of course, configure uh, your private API keys, which is something, um, well, it's probably better to do on your own machine, or you can just mock the data. And by mocking the data, you don't even have to worry about putting in your credentials. Instead, you will get the mock data. And we will make sure that this is very much in line with what you will get from the actual APIs. So as you can see, this query is uh, bringing together multiple stuff. So it's bringing together dev.do, as you can see here, uh, it's bringing together Twitter because it's kept me some uh, Twitter details. And somewhere in here, it's also getting GitHub for me. But let's focus on uh, the first one. So we go here, you can see we have GitHub details, Twitter details, and then we can just run this one. It's gonna ask us to run the combined one. And you can see it's actually mocking my data. It's a bit smaller, so you can actually see what's going on. So this is mocking the data for me. You can see we still have the same format as we saw on the slide. So you would have a query um, with this name, you have data returned with this name, then you have all these different fields and all the data is mocked for you. And of course, you can also insert your own credentials to make it even easier. And this is something you can already put into our, into our projects that you're, uh, you're building on your own device. So there are multiple ways to do this. So you can either publish this whole API into this endpoint, or you can just copy this fancy endpoint here and start using it in a product already. I'm sure it's copied. So now I will go to a, um, a Jamstack application, in this case, uh, something in React and Next.js. I can actually send, start sending queries to this specific thing. So to this specific GraphQL API that has been created by me in the StepSend Studio. Uh, and now I can actually query this from any application. So if you would go to 
uh, to your code and I can share the uh, location of the sample with you later on. Uh, you can find, I'm using this query. I have it defined somewhere, probably have it defined here. So here it is. So this is the query which I copied from uh, the studio. It has my devto uh, query. It has my nested field to get GitHub details. It also has my nested fields to get further information. And from my, um, from my component, I can actually fetch this. And the fetching is being done here at the bottom, server side, because that's of course important to know if you're sending requests to an API and you're passing along credentials, make sure to do it server side unless you want to leak some credentials. And often it's fine because it could be the credentials from that specific user that's sending the request. In this case, you settled. If you're sending requests from your own API, like your own API keys, which you're using from uh, other SaaS APIs, make sure to do it server side, not to leak them. Uh, so this endpoint is the endpoint from GraphQL Studio, which has been deployed for me. And this is my query, which I just showed you. I'm passing a variable, which is my own uh, Twitter name um, or that though name in this scenario, because that though is the leading query. Uh, and then I'm going to use this to get my data. And whenever I would start this application, so I can start the application using NPM, I'm going to start my um, my next year's application, it's probably in my browser. And then it's loading here. It's showing mock data, uh, but you can see it's getting data from three sources, right? So we have the latest depth of toe articles, the latest data repositories, and then also a thin tweet. And this is all mock data. Of course, you can include your own credentials. And by including your own credentials, you can, of course, create your own custom portfolio site. So later on, I'll be sharing a Get a page with you, and on this Get a page, you can actually find this example and other examples as well. And the nice thing is here is by working together within the studio and also within your local uh, environment, you can introspect here, so you can see what it looks like. You can see whatever schemas are available, and then just use them here. Make sure to mock them unless you put in your credentials and see what the results look like. And by looking at these results. For the first start, you might even copy over this JSON and plug it into your application and see what happens there. Or you can just uh, actually publish this one. So by publishing it, you can also link your account to it to make sure you don't lose any of the things you're doing here. Uh, just by publishing it, you will get this endpoint that we already used in our uh, Gemstack application. But you can also download and build it. So by downloading it, you'll be downloading the schemas uh, that were created in the Steps and Studio. So, Downloading the schemas is something I already done for you. And I can actually take this, uh, these files, take these files for you on my second screen. So here we have them. And then we're actually going to be pasting them inside our Jamstack application. Let's put it on the top level. I'm going to put these folders. Yeah, this myself, luckily. And then you can see here we have uh, this information. And then we actually want to make sure that these end up there. Moving them, of course, there as well. Okay. So these are the files I just copied. And then the final thing I need to do is actually take this file in as well. This is my index file. What I've just done, I went to GraphQL Studio. I created something in the studio. So I combined three APIs, which is Depto, GitHub, and Twitter. And actually, instead of using the API, API endpoint that's generated for me, I'm actually going to be taking these things inside my own project. And by copying all these files that I can just download from the, the studio, I can actually put them inside my project and then have steps I'm running here locally which means if I run it here locally, I can deploy from my own device instead of having to do it from the IDE, which means I can also connect my own data sources. So now we've been using pre-built data sources uh, like the SaaS APIs or service APIs. We can also create schemas for my own endpoints. So if you already have a REST API that you want to connect up here, or you maybe have a REST API that we don't cover in Studio, you can bring them all in here and write your own GraphQL schemas in order to, uh, to run them. So let's have a look at what these things look like. Just get rid of the namespace for the directory because I just got rid of them. 
this, you can see we have four different files. Uh, we have the index GraphQL file, which is the main file, which has all these files that we want to include. And then we have an example at DevDo. And as you can see here, um, it's actually calling the endpoints from DevDo. So we are using the DevDo REST API through StepSend. And the same is being done for GitHub. It's also using things here, but probably it's using the GitHub GraphQL API instead. It's a bit long to scroll through, just go to the Twitter one. So in Twitter, you can see we also have this schema that we downloaded from Studio. And then it's also using uh, the address connector. And so I don't connect any databases or other GraphQL APIs in here. Instead, I just connect REST APIs. But of course, you can perfectly well connect any API that you like. And then you can also start uh, StepSend here locally. Let me just kill the portfolio website and run StepSend start. Uh, make sure that you're logged in before. I'm already logged in. Going steps and start. It's going to look for my index GraphQL file, and then it's going to take um, all these different GraphQL files and make a GraphQL API out of it. What do we want to be called? Let's just type API slash the jam, not the ham, although I might like some ham later on. The jam, and now it's going to start and create my um, GraphQL API for me. You see, I'm missing a file, so let me copy over that last file that we were missing. Restart it and then we should be fine. So now it's actually deploying all these GraphQL files and the, um, the connections that we made to the REST APIs to StepSend, which will make it available through a local host, as you can see here. Uh, but it will also make it available on this endpoint. And this endpoint is a combination of my username and the API endpoint I just created. So if you would be um, connecting to this from a Gensec application, make sure to always use this deployed endpoint because we will make sure it's performant. So that's in short what I wanted to show you in terms of the demo. And if I would go back to my presentation, you can see you can find GraphQL Studio right here by either scanning the QR code or by going to graphql.stepsend.com. Uh, but I also have this link for you, which is all the code examples that we have. So actually just started generating a whole new suite of, uh, of quick starts, which you can use, which are uh, in this organization uh, for basically a lot of different types of applications. So either if you're using a MySQL, endpoint, MySQL database and want to connect with a REST API, API and also make them available through a Gemstack application, go here and find all these examples. But that was mostly it. I believe we have, uh, um, I've also have a poll for you. Let me see if I already have the results coming in. So yeah, my poll question was, what's making GraphQL hard for you? And I see most of the people said creating schemas is the hardest part. So if you find creating schemas hard, then uh, please know that within steps and you can actually create schemas yourself. Uh, you would still need to use uh, GraphQL schema design language. So maybe it's a nice follow-up question that we can, uh, can take either in the Q and A or later on on Twitter is why do you find it hard to create schemas? I also saw quite some people answered uh, deploying services hard. Uh, so one of the things StepSend is actually covering for you is making it easy to deploy a GraphQL server. Um, so yeah, thanks for answering the poll. And also thanks for listening. Um, yeah, make sure to find me on Twitter if you have any questions later on that you maybe don't want to ask in the Q and A. And then I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference as we just uh, started out with a new day. So uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Roy. That was great. Um, I'm I'm really impressed by all the work you all have done on Steps in Studio. Uh, it's it's really it's changed a lot since the last I saw it. So like it's it's looking pretty impressive. It looks pretty easy to use. Um, I know. Uh, um, one of the things that I think is tough for folks because. We've been so used to using REST APIs for so long. Um, and I think, the, can what do you think is, what's your advice to somebody who's like trying to make that transition from using REST to using GraphQL? Yeah, so um, well, my first answer, of course, would be to use steps and things I showed you. But the most important answer I want to give people is uh, GraphQL resolvers are not, are not endpoints if you build your own server. 
So within steps, and we do a lot of things when we combine different rest endpoints to make sure there's caching, we make sure you don't overfetch. Uh, but if you create your own server, which is perfectly fine, of course, and you translate every endpoint into a resolver, uh, you need to make sure that you also have these optimizations because otherwise you'll still be having the same problems as you would be having uh, with your REST API, which could be performance, which could be over or under fetching. So often when I see people go into GraphQL from REST is typically generating uh, resolvers from endpoints, which can be tricky if you don't take into account all these performance issues that uh, you might already have. And if you're actually copying over to GraphQL. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I know, for instance, one of the things that, uh, that people seem to struggle with is, um, like you said, you 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 think of it. I mean, REST is easy. I can just kind of spit out whatever, and there's not really a thought because I you get you get what I send you, right? Like as we mm -hmm. tell my kids, you, you get what you get, and you don't get upset. Kind of <laughs> as yeah. the saying goes. Um, whereas with GraphQL, like the the person making the query can ask for whatever it is that they want. Which is powerful from the the querying standpoint, but also difficult to handle from the API building the API standpoint because you can I can I can ask for you have to actually kind of accommodate all the different things that they might ask for or deeply nesting different types and stuff like that to the point where you know I think certain times you'd like you have to kind of be careful because you can nest it to the point that you blow everything up right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So an example, uh, um, I mentioned the GitHub API. So GitHub has both a REST and a GraphQL API. And if you would look at the um, amount of requests you can do with both, you can see it's actually quite limited for the GraphQL API, simply for these reasons. Because if you deeply nest, you might even get into some sort of infinite loop if you keep nesting and nesting and nesting. So you can imagine they had some sort of ray limiting that was a bit more aggressive. Uh, but yeah, GraphQL can definitely be hard from the backend part because you need to do all these optimizations in order to make sure the front end um, or the person querying so the client is being optimized. Right. Yep. Totally. Um, so uh, Steve asks, how does Stepsan handle availability or other error cases that occur on the GraphQL sources it's aggregating? Yes. Yeah, so that would depend. Um, so if you look at how people handle errors in GraphQL, you often have um, something called a nullable or non-nullable non field. So it really depends where you get your data from. So often in GraphQL, when you don't get any data from a source, uh, even if you build your own or it steps in, it's going to throw an errors object and that error object will probably make sure that one of the values get nullified. Mm -hmm. uh, so we basically do the same thing. And if any of your service is unavailable, then steps in will probably also will be unavailable because we can't give you data that we can't get for you. That makes sense. So, so like if, but if uh, if I if I have a say a query that aggregates multiple sources, it would only be that one source that might have gone down that I can't access. Everything else should be accessible, right? Yeah, definitely. So if you get data from GitHub and Twitter, um, and one of them is down, you will get data from. Uh, the one that's up and the one that's down doesn't return any data unless uh, you want to get data from Twitter and then through Twitter information get data from somewhere else because of course the first uh, the first data source you're pulling from is unavailable and you need input from that source for something else then of course that won't work right that makes sense so you have to you have to take that into account you're still aggregating many sources so you have to account for like potentially errors within those aggregations in a way. Yeah, definitely. And we have caching, but uh, generally you don't want to cache results that are unavailable. So you could make use of the cache, but uh, probably better not. It's OK. None of these things go down. Twitter never. GitHub absolutely never goes down, right? So I'm not worried about it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Sean asks, how do you recommend we decorate content coming from an API? If a few APIs have most of what I need, but my, my page needs a little more data, where should I put it? Um, yes, yeah, so could you repeat that? Sure. Uh, he asks, how do you recommend we decorate content coming from an API? If a few APIs have most of what I need, but my page needs a little more data. Where should I put it? I think he's th he's saying like, okay, I I want 
if I'm aggregating different pieces, but I need to actually add additional data onto there, um, how how would you recommend doing that? Can you do that in steps in, or do you have to? Would you have to do that on um, on whatever client's consuming it? Uh, so it depends what you're trying to do. So uh, the nice thing about steps in is that you can bring together all these sources. So if that extra piece of data that you need is coming from an API or a database, uh, you can bring it in steps in and return it from there. If that extra piece of content is coming from maybe a local file, um, then probably it's something you can use within your application. So if you have markdown, uh, a markdown file, an example, somewhere in your project, uh, you mm -hmm. can probably use a markdown file uh, and put it in directly instead of handling through steps in. If you would have those markdown files, maybe in an API coming from a different source, maybe a CMS or maybe a GitHub repository, then you can just put it in a schema and then pull it from that source and combine it with all the other um, all the other data that you already have in steps on. Okay. So one of the things I think, you know, um, <clears throat> the benefits I've I've found of GraphQL as somebody who like can mostly just consumes it, I um, that uh, I wanted to kind of talk about was the fact that it's, it's kind of self-documenting in a way, right? So so I found one of the, with REST APIs, obviously I can give you whatever it is, you know, the result, <clears throat> the result is whatever I determine I want to give you as the API developer, right? And so we end up with these like kind of complex API docs where and every time I have to use a different REST API, I'm digging through API docs to figure out what it is I'm supposed to get and how, how I'm supposed to query each endpoint and you'll have like Docs for each endpoint, and it's just it's um, and sometimes even different endpoints in the same API aren't consistent in the way they send back things and stuff like that. So, so tell us about how like GraphQL helps to solve those problems for developers. Yeah, definitely. So um, people often say GraphQL APIs are self-documenting, which um, is partly true, but partly not true. So they're self-documenting through the type system. Uh, so if you construct your schema, you're actually saying uh, what all the types are of these different fields. You would have a field um, which could be a string. You have a field which could be some sort of uh, nested relationship. So then we'd be referring to other types. And this is all documented in, um, in your GraphQL schema. And then there are uh, services or tools that you can use in order to read those schemas and then to explore the API. So I showed you Steps in Studio, which is using the schema uh, in order to give you some sort of documenting. Uh, but also, if you deploy your endpoint, you will get a GraphQL IDE. Or actually, we try to call it an IDE, but it's a bit like Postman specifically for GraphQL. And then there are multiple flavors of this. So you have GraphQL, you have GraphQL Playground, uh, which are all sort of related to each other. Uh, but the thing you can do there is you can um, uh, read your schema in a more, uh, more visual way. So of course you can read your schema within your own IDE or from any API endpoint or through introspection because it's also something GraphQL offers. You can send a request to your server um, to ask for introspection and return the whole schema. Uh, but you can do the same from all these browser-based IDEs or, uh, or tools. So the GraphQL Playground is the most, um, uh, the most popular one. And in that one, you can actually uh, look at your schema. You can play with your schema so you can send queries from the playground as well um, for the interface. Uh, so you don't have to go to a terminal or go to Postman, but you can directly do this from, uh, from the playground with your schema next to it. So in that way, it's self-documenting because if you need a field, you can find it in the schema if it's there or if it's not. Uh, but also, GraphQL will use this in order to give you out the completion. So whenever you try to write down your query, uh, you can already see if uh, a field exists or not. So you can do this either from the GraphQL Playground or if you're using an IDE like PS Code, which I do, uh, you can actually hook it up to your server and then have the auto-completion there as well. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, the, uh, pretty tough documenting. Yeah, the auto-completion is, is something that is is uh, fantastic. I mean, I guess the only from, from my standpoint, like sometimes I struggle with the fact that like you, GraphQL, you also have to learn to specify everything you want, like you you get exactly what you want, but you have to specify everything that you want. It can't be like like select star kind of thing. I have to tell it, oh, I want all these fields kind of thing, um, which you know. So so there's 
but you do get that auto completion, which makes it a lot easier to construct those queries. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So with a REST API, you would get that uh, select star, select all. So if you would have a REST API hooked up to your MySQL database, you'll probably get all the tables from there. And with GraphQL, you really don't have it. So that's also a nice part. So if you would be wrapping REST APIs with GraphQL, you maybe don't have that efficiently layer. If you actually have a database, then you won't have that select star thing. And we will make sure, or GraphQL will make sure that you will only get the fields that you request. So that's a nice um, efficiency bonus. And auto-completion uh, will definitely help us with it. Right. So um, one other thing, I, I mean, you showed it a little bit in your presentation. Um, and I know it's kind of a deep topic to cover, but I want to kind of explain to folks because there was a bit of use of GraphQL directives in there. And it's one of those features I think people tend to like, especially those of us who mostly end up consuming GraphQL, really don't understand what a GraphQL directive is, what does it do, and and like how are they really powerful? Yeah, so um, I think I briefly mentioned it. The GraphQL directives are, so there are some built-in directives which are used uh, client-side, um, but you can also use them um, use them server side. So we're using directive server side and then custom directive. So you build your own. You can actually extend a GraphQL server or a GraphQL schema. So the way we do it in Stepsen is we use custom directives to handle data connections. So if you would want to get data from the REST API or from the database, we use a custom directive to do so right from your schema. So instead of writing resolver code, we use these custom directives to extend your schema uh, to be able to get this data from different data sources. If you look at the build-in uh, directives, uh, they're actually used to include or to hide data. So you might understand if you have a query and the query response um, has a certain shape, you can actually say if this field is null, I want to include something from a different part of my query. Or if this piece of information is um, over a certain value, you want to include extra value. So you can actually use this. So we looked at the uh, relationships we had. So maybe you want to get the author of a post from your CMS. If the uh, if one of the fields in the post is empty, namely the field that would get the ID of that, um, that author of the post, then you already know that you don't have to include that extra relationship. So these built-in directives will help you with things like this. Uh, but custom directives, like we use with steps and they help you to extend the schema. Uh, by pulling in your uh, your data sources from somewhere else, like your REST API, your MySQL uh, database, or your GraphQL API, uh, but also to combine information from these things. So one of the things we're doing is if you have a type called post, in example, and you want to uh, link it to the author, and the author is coming from a different query, you can use another custom directive in order to get uh, responses from one query and combine them into a different query as well. So they're quite powerful, especially for uh, this extensibility part. Right. Yeah. So, so I think you know the the key thing I, I think I wanted to share was that that you mentioned is that this is part of the GraphQL spec. This is not like, oh, hey, you know, we're we're writing something that's not legit GraphQL. Like directives are part of the spec, and you can, and so StepSense obviously created a bunch of custom directives, but then you're still writing legitimate. Uh, you know, uh, GraphQL query language. It's not, or schema language, sorry. Uh, you're not like, you're not writing some custom code here. It's still, it's, it's legitimate GraphQL because GraphQL has that extensibility built into the spec. And there are, and there are other directives, right? Beyond just what Stepson offers. You can, if you're building your own server, you can actually create your own or install ones that are built by the community and such. Yeah, definitely. So uh, you see a lot of different libraries and other uh, companies as well creating their own custom directives. And there are some built in, and then we've all these uh, other custom ones. So it would be nice, though, maybe it's um, if someone needs a new startup ID, it would be nice to have some sort of directory of all these different custom directives. People can actually see which ones are taken and which ones aren't. So yeah. if someone really gets inspired by this talk about GraphQL and has some extra time, please try and create it. Yeah, that's that's a good idea because I did notice there were certain ones like you had different people do different implementations of very similar 
directives across different servers. So I think you could get into a place where you, you know, the beauty of, of GraphQL is that you don't need to go through all those API docs all the time and try and figure out what, how this REST API works, right? But I guess if there's, if people are kind of end up using a lot of custom directives, you end up, um, being a, like it can, you can alter the way that that works in a way, make it a little more like, okay, this, this API works this particular way versus that API works differently. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you, as you can use custom directives, uh, server side and client side, it'd especially be nice to know which libraries are using which custom directives. So you won't, um, yeah. so they won't interfere at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one, one last question. So obviously you have your book, but like what if, since I know a lot of folks may not have even done a lot of GraphQL, like in terms of either consuming GraphQL or learning how to build, you know, uh, the schema definition language and stuff, what are your recommendations for places that they can go learn about this? Yeah, definitely. So if you go to the, uh, the main GraphQL website from the GraphQL organization, which is uh, graphql.org. You can find a lot of tutorials there and also um, really starter kits. And I showed you, um, well, a small implementation of the GitHub GraphQL API, uh, but it's also a really nice way to start because as we discussed, it's self-documenting in a way. Uh, so you can actually start by using the um, GitHub GraphQL API to see actually your latest repos and support. And that can be a nice way to, uh, to getting started with this, uh, Oh, with the whole GraphQL experience. Right, right. Uh, somebody in the chat mentioned that the directives sound like NPM, but with, you know, the custom directives are like adding NPM libraries in a way, in, in a little bit of a way, I guess, I suppose. Other than, other than yeah, the fact so that directives have um, to be specified in a particular way. Yeah. But. Yeah, so for now it's mostly creating your own uh, TypeScript type, de type definitions and making yes. them available to others. Uh, but it would be nice uh, if maybe in a future it could be like a, an npm registry for these directives mm -hmm. yes exactly so um all right well thank you roy that was great um hopefully everybody learned a lot about graphql and goes and checks out the steps in studio so really appreciate you speaking thanks so much yes thank you and uh, thanks everyone for listening and i hope you um, will enjoy the rest of this day